Would you pray with me? Father, we sing those words, if ever we loved you. Father, it is in this moment. Father, we celebrate your love for us. Father, we celebrate your sacrifice of your son for us at Calvary. Father, we acknowledge your love for us. Recognizing, as Jesus said, those who love me will do what I say. And so, Lord, we want to hear what you have to say to us. We want to hear what Jesus has to say to us in these moments from your word. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts. Father, we're waiting here to hear you speak to us, that we may hear and that we may respond. So, Father, open our eyes that we might see. Open our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we may respond to you this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I spy with my little eye something that's red. Anyone? No. The letters are the numbers on the clock. You don't even know it's there. I know it's there. I pay no attention to it. <laughs> I spy with my little eye something that's orange. Anything? The leaves on the banner behind me. That's right. Now, were I playing this game with Allison, and she said the leaves... I would continue by saying, but which one? <laughs> See, it's all part of my parenting strategy, philosophy. And one day my parenting philosophy will be introduced in book form, and it will be titled, Teasing and Tormenting Your Children to Emotional Maturity. <laughs> See, I've already, got, I've already got it here. Which one? Well, it's likely that the vast majority of, of us have played that simple game at some time on our life's journey. I spy with my little eye. And in a sense, we've been playing that game with Jesus over the past several weeks. We've been seeing or spying with our own eyes things which Jesus saw and took note of. Thus, we have seen that Jesus spied with his little eye, Nathaniel, under a fig tree, and an invalid by a pool, and a commotion in the home of Jairus. And he spied faith in some that brought their friend to him. And he spied his disciples making headway painfully against the winds in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And last week we saw that he spied it, Something that was more horrifying than even Pennywise the clown. He saw his disciples coming between himself and little children. Well, we continue our little game with Jesus this morning in Mark chapter 8. Jesus is in the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is about 30 miles north of Capernaum and 30 miles north of the northernmost tip of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, at this point, is about as far away from Jerusalem as he has ever been in his travels. And it's from here that he begins his final journey to Jerusalem, a journey which took approximately a little bit more than six months to make. And here he begins his final approach, his final descent, not only to Jerusalem, but also to Calvary and the cross. And it's here again we see what Jesus saw. 
something he spied with his own eyes. And that which drew his attention that day was none other than his disciples. Turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Something is going on here. Jesus saw something that he didn't like at all. In a matter of moments, interacting with his disciples here near Caesarea Philippi, Jesus saw both the good and the bad in his disciples. He saw both a glorious victory on behalf of the disciples, and likewise he saw a stunning setback. Which leads us here where we want to unpack this morning. Jesus sees both, as followers of Jesus Christ, our glorious victories, and he sees our stunning setbacks as we journey with him, yet he continues to walk with us through it all. This morning from our text, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38, I want to look at three aspects of Jesus' conversation with his disciples that day, and then we'll draw some points of application as we see what Jesus saw near Caesarea Philippi. Let's take a look. So the first aspect of Jesus' conversation with his disciples that day was this. He, he saw a, a, good con, a good confession by his disciples. It was attaboy time for his disciples. As they made this confession, you are the Christ. Now, it may be proof helpful to, to get a feel for how our current text fits into the flow of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 begins like this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For Mark chapter 1, verse 1, through Mark chapter 8, verse 26, Mark records many of the Messiah-like things that Jesus did in the first two and a half years of his ministry. During the course of those two and a half years, he, he exercises authority over demons. He heals many with diseases and deafness and blindness. And Jesus teaches with unprecedented authority. People were amazed at his teaching. Where does he get this stuff? People were asking. And he defies the laws of nature by walking on the water not once, but twice. And by controlling the wind and the waves. He defies the law of nature by making a meal for over 5,000 people with simply two fish and five loaves of bread. And we see him resurrecting the dead. All of this in these first passage or portion of Mark's gospel are intended to give those with any degree of spiritual acuity and perception a heads up as to his messiahship. He is trying to give huge clues that he is no ordinary man, that he is something well beyond that. Which brings us to our text beginning in Mark chapter 8 verse 27 a passage which many of you to be as the very center, the very heart, the very turning point of Mark's gospel. And there we read, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? I, I've been at this for two and a half years now. I've done all these things. So, so what's the buzz on the street? What are people saying about me? And so the disciples say, well, here's what we're hearing. And they told him. Some say John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. You see, after two and a half years of raising the dead and calming the seas and, and feeding the hungry and healing the blind. Most people saw Jesus in some sort of forerunner or preparatory role pointing to a yet coming Messiah or Christ. They thought that he's a big deal, but he is not the big deal. 
The dignity and the glory of Jesus was not apparent to the vast majority of people. And so I, I can't help but wonder, as Jesus hears what the disciples say the people are saying about him, I wonder if Jesus was, ever, was just a bit disheartened by the crowd's evaluation. <sighs> what do I have to do? He pressed his point, and this was really his point. This is really where, really where he wanted to get. And he asked them. He asked his disciples. But what do you say that I am? Jesus lays it all out there. Jesus makes himself tremendously vulnerable. The next moments, the response of those closest to him will be either the best of times or the worst of times. So Peter, a spokesman and leader of the Twelve, replies, You are the Christ. Whew! I can't help but Jesus say, hear Jesus saying that, just laying out, exhaling. All right, at least someone gets me. What was lost on the masses was not lost on those who were closest to him. They saw it, they got it, they understood the glory of Jesus. He is the Christ. Now in the Old Testament, there were many Christs. There were many messiahs. The, the word simply means the anointed one or anointed ones. As you read through the Old Testament, you, you find prophets and priests and kings. They were all anointed. They were all people called or given a divine calling and received divine power to fulfill a divine task. And all of these lesser anointed ones looked ahead and pointed forward to the one who would not merely be an anointed one, but who would be the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. Here Mark's gospel reaches its crescendo. The syllables or the symbols crash. The drums roll. The cannons boom. You are the Christ. Yes, they had it. They got it. And Matthew records this event and adds these words. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Peter. Good job, Peter. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Clearly, God had been at work in Peter, leading Peter to this conclusion about the identity and person of Jesus. Now understand, if you have come to know and seen and understand and embrace the glory of Jesus, it's not because you're smarter than others, but it is because God himself has been at work in you, revealing the glory of Christ to you. This understanding, when we come to this understanding about who Jesus is, it's not a cause for personal pride. It is a cause for glorious praise for that which God has done and is doing in you. Much of, for each one of us, rides on our understanding of who Jesus is and our response to him. Again, if you have come to recognize Jesus as Savior who suffered and died for you, who died on the cross in your place for your sin, it is not a cause for pride, but it is a cause for praise to the living God. And having heard this, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. Shh! See, the, ma the masses were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a Christ, but they weren't looking for someone like Jesus. They were looking for a powerful warrior to cast out the Romans. So he says, hey, keep this close to your vest lest false hopes and expectations be raised among the masses and likewise be raised within yourselves. So the first part of the conversation that day, 
near Caesarea Philippi. It, the disciples made a good confession. You are the Christ. And Jesus celebrated that confession, that understanding that they had come to. But the second aspect of their conversation included this, a clarifying explanation for his disciples. The text says he began to teach them. And then he began to teach them. Jesus began to explain to his disciples what it meant for him to be the Christ and what things would look like going forward as he headed to Jerusalem and as they headed to Jerusalem with him. And so Jesus begins to say, this is what you need to know. Yes, you're right, I'm the Christ. And here's what you need to know about me, the Christ. And began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Jesus said the the road ahead is one of suffering, is one of betrayal and isolation and denial and scourgings and beatings and abandonment and ultimately death. The Son of Man, Jesus was telling his disciples, I, the Christ, must suffer many things and be rejected. That that word reject, it, it means to to fail to pass scrutiny. You go to a a jeweler and you say, hey, is my ring the real thing? And he gets out his eyepiece and he examines it very closely. Or you go to a research facility, a doctor. They take a blood sample and they put it under the microscope to see if there's any impurities, anything there that shouldn't be there. If something amiss is found, if the gold in the ring turns out to be fool's gold, it will be rejected as not genuine. What Jesus is saying is that I am going to be coming under scrutiny. I am going to be examined under the microscope by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I am going to be done put under the microscope by these leaders in Israel. And their conclusion is going to be, this is no Christ. This is a charlatan. And he must go. So he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed. The, The word kill here points to a violent but unspecified means of death at the hands of others. Suffer, be rejected, be killed. Oh, Jesus throws in, and after three days rise again. Well, that just seems to go right over the disciples' head. They didn't even respond to that. But with these words, Jesus began to clarify for his disciples what it would mean for him to be the Christ. He had pointed through his words to Isaiah chapter 53. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to what? To suffer. The servant of the Lord, the Christ. It will be God's purpose to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after the suffering of his soul, of the Messiah of the Christ soul. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Jesus' journey and the disciples' journey alongside of Jesus would not be one, would be one of pain and not pleasure. It would be one of rejection and not acceptance. And the text says, he said this plainly. He held nothing back. Jesus said, you have identified me as a Christ. You need to know what kind of Messiah I am, and you need to know what is not only ahead for me, but will ultimately be ahead of you. Jesus pulled no punches. For me to be the Christ is a painful thing. For you to be a follower of the Christ will likewise bring its own pain to you. And the disciples, Jesus knew, needed to know that. And so you have a clarifying explanation of what it means to be the Christ, or for Jesus to be the Christ. But then the third part of their conversation is a stinging rebuke of the disciples. 
Get behind me, Satan, Jesus said. Suffering, rejection, death. This was not at all where the disciples thought they'd end up with Jesus. They had followed him expecting a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And Jesus was talking about a bubbling cauldron of trouble. This was not at all what they had signed up for. Not what they had followed Jesus for two and a half years to experience. This was not all what they had visioned their future with Jesus to look like. Jesus understood Jesus to be the promised Messiah, or his disciples understood Jesus to be the promised Messiah, the Christ. But their understanding of what that would mean and what that would look like was not far removed from that of the general population of Palestine. In their minds, Messiah Jesus' itinerary for the near future would be deliverance from the Romans. The Messiah, the Christ, would kick them out destroy and defeat them, and that there would be a throne established once again, the throne of David in Israel. And on that throne, the Messiah would sit, and he would reign, and he would rule over God's kingdom on earth. And the disciples had followed Jesus with that picture in mind and with that hope in their hearts and with that expectation that they were getting in on the ground floor of the glory to be revealed in the very coming days. They wanted their hands on the reins and all the blessings that would accrue to them through their association with Jesus. Well, upon hearing things like this, there is only one thing to be done. As Jesus talks about suffering and rejection and death, there's only one thing to to be done. Peter, again, the leader of the disciples, says, Jesus, come, come here. He pulls him aside. And he began to rebuke him. Boy, Peter was good. The disciples were good at rebuking. Last year, last week, we saw they rebuked the children. Now, Peter has the audacity to try to set Jesus straight. Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about being the Christ. Let me tell you. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him which in hushed tones and in whispered words. Jesus, stop talking like this. Don't you know anything about being the Christ? But turning, Jesus turned and seeing his other disciples, the other 11, he saw on their faces immediately that they were in step with Peter and his expectations of Jesus. Peter was giving expression to that which was in all of his apostles' hearts. And so Jesus turns the table. Peter rebuked Jesus. Now Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus had heard this all before. You can have the glory, Jesus, minus the suffering. Jesus, you can experience the crown minus the cross. And now that temptation was not coming in the wilderness, but on the road to Jerusalem. But the source was the same. Recall Luke chapter 4. And Satan left Jesus in the wilderness and looked, would look for a more opportune time to tempt him, to lay aside God's plan for Jesus, his son. Jesus understood the source. Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. You're not looking at me as a Messiah from God's perspective. You're only looking at it from your own perspective. This is the kind of Jesus we want. This is what Jesus needs to be doing for us. This is why I follow you, Jesus. Not for suffering, rejection, and death. I want the pot of gold. Jesus knew where their minds were in that moment. Peter had in mind an agenda which would lead to the death of his enemies. 
and not his own death. He had an agenda in mind that would lead to an earthly kingdom and personal power. And Jesus had in mind an agenda that would lead to his own personal suffering, yet mankind's salvation. Jesus knew that he would need his disciples to support him on his journey, not dissuade him from it. So he directed a stinging rebuke to his disciples. The fourth aspect of Jesus' conversation with his disciples that day was a necessary correction to all his would-be disciples. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said. To this point, Jesus has been celebrating with his disciples. Good answer. And he's been clarifying things for his disciples, the twelve. And he has been rebuking privately his disciples. But beginning in verse 34, Jesus expands his audience. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, the crowd with his disciples, now he turns his attention not only to the twelve, but to all the people standing around. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, the whole group, because he knew that if those closest to him could be so far off base, how much more those who are more curious about him than committed to him. And so Jesus raises his voice and calls everybody close to him, come on in, bring it in, so that they can hear what he has to say. And, and what Jesus says, in essence, is that he is leading no one to an earthly pot of gold. You need to know this, Jesus is saying. And if they think that's the case, they need to be set straight here and now, just like his disciples needed to be set straight. So he calls everybody in and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Time doesn't allow us to unpack this passage in the way that it deserves, but Jesus' intent is clear. I am not your ticket to earthly fame and fortune, to temporal power and prestige. Far from it. You need to recalibrate your mind and your heart if you want to be my disciple. You need to recalibrate away from what you expect to gain and to get from me and focus on what you stand and gain to get from me in eternity. This is something every disciple needs to be reminded of each and every moment of each and every day. Jesus doesn't punch my ticket for time. He punches it for eternity. Right now in this life, following Jesus can mean suffering and rejection. Maybe in some cases, some place in the world, it means death. But Jesus doesn't leave us hanging there. He says, oh, but there'll be a day when you will see the Son of Man, you will see me, the Christ, come in my Father's glory with his holy angels. And oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We're not there yet. There's a lot to happen between now and then. But Jesus said, that day is coming. Hang on to that hope. So Jesus took the time to make a necessary correction to all his would-be disciples. Well, that day near Caesarea Philippi, as Jesus started his approach to Jerusalem, Jesus saw his disciples. He didn't simply see them with his eye, but he understood their hearts and what they were thinking. He saw beneath the surface. And when he saw that day, he, Jesus saw his disciples growing in their understanding of him, and he celebrated it. He saw, you are the Christ. Jesus said, boy, you are getting there. 
How, how did you react as parents when your child reached a new milestone? How did you react to the first word? Or to the first step? Or to the first day of kindergarten? Uh, well, kid, that's okay, but I've been talking for a long time. Nah, I've been walking miles in my life. It's no big, no. We celebrate it. That first step, we celebrate the disciples had taken a step in their understanding of Jesus, and Jesus celebrated it. He was excited about it. How do we respond when we see a, a Christian take a new step of maturity or commitment or faithfulness or see the light go on in their understanding of biblical truth and the application of truth to their own lives? When we see and have evidence that God is at work in someone li- someone's life, how do we respond? Uh, I knew that. Oh, yeah, that's old stuff. No, we get excited that God is revealing things to those who are walking with Jesus. When it comes to our attention, personal growth in someone else, or even in ourselves, may we celebrate it and may we encourage it. And as we notice something happening within ourselves, as we grasp a new truth and make different choices, Oh, may we celebrate and give thanks to our Heavenly Father that He has been active in our life. When Jesus saw spiritual growth in His disciples, He celebrated it. Oh, may we celebrate it in others and in ourselves. But secondly, Jesus saw His disciples projecting their agenda onto Him, and He rejected it. The disciples had formed a picture in their mind of what life with Jesus should and would look like. And when Jesus started painting a different picture, they objected and they got frustrated with Jesus. Jesus isn't all at all what I signed up for. Have you ever been there? Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, where are you taking me? Jesus, how could you let that happen? This wasn't on the agenda. Jesus, who do you think you are to ask so much of me? Jesus, when are you going to do something? See, we we can so easily have our agenda for Jesus. We place our expectations on Jesus, and we become frustrated with him. And like Peter, we have the audacity to rebuke the Christ, the Son of the living God, for not getting in step with us. In those moments when our agenda of Jesus competes with his agenda for us, oh, may we do as the Apostle Paul counsels, oh, may we set our minds on things that are above and not on things on the earth. And may we find comfort in this as we get in step with Jesus' agenda for us, knowing this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I do have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Oh, Jesus saw his disciples protecting their agenda onto him, and he rejected it and set them straight. Thirdly, Jesus saw his disciples needing a teaching moment, and he provided it. Praise God that when our understanding of his word, of his will, and of his ways are incomplete and inadequate, and our lives are not reflecting well upon him, Jesus doesn't brush us aside, but he calls us aside. And he speaks to our needs so that we can continue, as Peter says, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. At the end of his life, Peter was saying, ah, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter was saying, that day near Caesarea Philippi, that was a day of growing in the grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus gave me that, that teaching moment. And, and when Jesus gives us a teaching moment, whether they come through the word of God as we give our hearts to it and read it, or if it comes from someone else who is farther along in their journey with Christ, oh, may we not brush it off, may we not be offended, but may we be teachable in those moments. About a month ago, I read a blog from Ray Ortland in his blog, Christ is Still Deeper. And he said this, and I 
He said, this, this is what the church should be. The environment the church should provide. Gospel plus safety plus time equals a church where anyone can grow. And he explains it this way. Gospel is the good news for bad people through, through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit. He says, wave upon wave of grace and truth, according to the Bible, should fill every church. And he said the church should be a place of safety. It should provide a non-accusing environment. No, embarrass, not, no embarrassing anyone. No cornering anyone. No shaming anyone. But respect and sympathy and listening and understanding so that people can exhale and open up and burden their souls. A church needs to provide an environment when no one seeking the Lord has anything to fear. And he says, to, a, a church where anyone can grow, it needs a gospel, it needs safety, and it needs time. He says, no pressure. Not even self-imposed pressure. No deadlines on growth. Urgency, yes, but not hurry. Because no one changes quickly. A lot of space for complicated people to rethink their lives at a deep level. Jesus, he says, is patient. And then he concludes, this is what our churches must be. Gentle environments of gospel and safety and time. And that's what Jesus gave his disciples. Oh, may this church be such a place as that and provide an environment such as that. Jesus saw his disciples needing a teaching moment. An environment in which they could grow. And he provided it. Oh, and may we provide that in our church, in our homes, in our relationships. The disciples with Jesus that day, they, they knew both glorious victories, you are the Christ, and stunning setbacks. Get behind me, Satan. But the disciples kept allowing Jesus to teach them that they might be Melted, molded, filled, and used for his purposes. Oh, may every follower of Jesus take advantage of every teaching moment the Holy Spirit provides for us. That day, near Caesarea Philippi, Jesus saw his disciples, both a victory and a setback, and he lovingly urged them to get in step with him, to take up their cross as he would shortly take up his own, and to follow him. And the disciples did that, and so may we. The song says, Jesus, I my cross have taken. I've said no to myself and said yes to you. Oh, may we take up our cross as Jesus took up his. And may we follow Jesus faithfully, earnestly, confidently, and hopefully. May this testimony be our own as we listen to the song, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken. <laughs> Jesus, I my cross have taken All to leave and follow thee Destitute, despised, forsaken Thou from hence my all shall be Perish every fond ambition i 
Father, we thank you for this conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Father, thank you for allowing us to listen in. Father, we would ask that you would provide from it what is necessary for each one of us. Father, may we be encouraged by Jesus' grace, his patience. Father, may we celebrate the victories that you give us. Father, may we set aside our agenda and live only according to your own. Father, we give you praise for Christ Jesus. We thank you that he went to the cross in our place for our sins. Father, we give you praise. And we give you glory. And we do so in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace.